And good morning, everybody. Welcome to you all this morning. And thank you for joining us to celebrate National Science Week. And also, as yesterday was International Women's Day, uh, we wanted to celebrate women in science as well. And uh, so good morning to you all. I'm Professor Sharon Green and I'm Deputy Head at the National Centre for Food Manufacturing at Whole Beach. Uh, we're in South Lincolnshire and we're part of the University of Lincoln. And I'm joined this morning by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Bacola Onorinde and Dr. Nicola Crew. And uh, we're going to talk to you about how science is really important in the food and drink sector. Science is vital to the food and drink sector and primary, um, the primary role of food scientists and technologies is to be responsible for ensuring that food and drink uh, are safe to consume and that they meet specific standards. So science plays a really important role when we're developing, testing and manufacturing products. And so without further ado, I'll hand you to Dr. Nicola Crew to introduce herself. Thank you very much, Professor Sharon. We are really pleased to be here today. I'm certainly thrilled to be able to talk to you. So I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Lincoln and the Whole Beach campus. And my background's in microbiology and molecular biology. And I actually started uh, my career in the food industry working for a testing laboratory, checking for food safety and authenticity in the industry. And since then, I've been lecturing at the University of Lincoln. And it's a real privilege to be with you here today. Thank you. And then Dr. Bacola, we're over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Bacola Noride, and I'm an associate professor here at the National Center for Food Manufacturing. Uh, I'm a food scientist and uh, a food uh, microbiologist, and uh, my role within the university is conducting research in collaboration with the food industry. So, Bacola, I think you're going to go off, uh, go first and talk to us about microbiology, which is your specialist subject. Yes. So thank you very much. As uh, Sharon said earlier, we're going to be uh, talking to you about how science helped the food and drink industry. And my presentation is divided into two parts. So the first part, as Sharon said, is I'll be giving a brief introduction about food microbiology and food safety. And uh, with the help of my uh, research assistant and our technician, uh, we will be demonstrating the use of two food analysis instruments. Uh, one uh, that mimics the uh, human nose and the second that mimics uh, the oral processing and the action and speed of of the jaw. So um, I'll just move on to my first uh, part is talking about food microbiology and food microbiology is the study of microorganisms that in a bit create or contaminate food. Food microbiology study focuses on uh, microorganisms that cause food spoilage, uh, microorganisms that cause disease, especially if food is not properly stored or properly cooked. And of course, we've got beneficial microorganisms as well. And uh, food microbiology focuses on beneficial microorganisms that are used to produce fermented foods in the food industry. So for my next three slides, um, I'm going to just give examples of uh, different microorganisms which are grouped into the good, the bad, and the ugly. So for the good microorganisms which are uh, of importance to the food industry, the first example is uh, a fungus which is uh, called uh, a, a yeast and uh, it's a uh, uh, scientific name is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and the image just below it is actually showing the microscopic view of yeast under, under the microscope. So as a microbiologist, I would help to identify this organism uh, in, in the microbiology lab. And uh, the use of this organism is for fermentation of bread uh, in the food industry. Uh, the second example is um, uh, lact Lactobacillus acidophilus, and this is a bacterium which is used for uh, fermentation of, of, of food. It can be used for fermentation of dairy products and the fermentation of meat, or also for the fermentation of uh, vegetables. So under the microscope, uh, again, uh, this is how uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus uh, looks. So. Uh, my example of a good virus, of course, we do have good viruses, uh, is a bacteriophage. And bacteriophage is um, a virus that helps to control uh, bacteria in an environment or in the food 
uh, in, in foods. But the application of bacteriophage within the food industry is very limited because there is still a lot of research to be done to ascertain the potential and the safety of, of, of this microorganism. And this is a, a view, a microscopic view of a, a, a T4 phage on the an electron microscope. So uh, the next group of um, organisms I'm going to be uh, talking about are the bad microorganisms. So uh, the first example is a fungus, which is a, a mold, and it's it's called bread mold sometimes. And uh, you can see the microscopic view of um, of, of this fungus uh, under the microscope, and it spoils food. So I'm not sure whether you've seen this before at home when uh, bread spoils. So this is uh, the fluffy bit that you find on spoiled bread is actually a mold called Rhizopus stolonifer, and also it can affect fresh produce uh, such as tomatoes as well. So the second example of microorganisms that, uh, uh, microorganism that I'm going to be talking about is Listeria monocytogenes. Uh, Listeria monocytogenes is uh, uh, an organism that is, uh, it, it's an organism that is um, widely spread in the environment and also can be found in different foods as well. So the microscopic view of Listeria uh, is shown in, in the image here, and uh, you would see that uh, Listeria has got some tentacle-like uh, structures around it, and this is called flagella, and this is used for uh, moving from one surface to another. And Listeria can also be found in uh, chew products such as cheeses. So the, uh, the, the last example of a bad microorganism is uh, a virus and it is called a norovirus. A norovirus is a, a nasty um, a microorganism as it does cause food poisoning. And uh, the most recent case with norovirus that uh, was reported was reported last year, December 2020, and uh, it affected a Belgian school where 150 students and staff were affected. So norovirus um, uh, can can cause illness and it is um, most of the time associated with fresh produce. So my last example uh, of uh, microorganism, and this is the nasty and ugly microorganism, and I've just given one example here, and it's a fungus as well. So it affects strawberry, and uh, the name of the organism is called Podosphera alfanis, and um, this um, organism do not only affect the product itself, it can affect the leaves, uh, the fields, and obviously the fruits as well. And this is the microscopic uh, view of uh, Podosphera, and also you can see the uh, strawberry affected by it and leaves as well. So it does cause a lot of economical and environmental damage, and that is why it's very nasty, and that is why it's being grouped as an ugly uh, microorganism. So I'm not sure if you've got any questions, Sharon. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Bacola. And it's great that you've told us about so many of these different organisms and been able to show us them on your pictures. But how can you as a microbiologist help the food industry to determine if they're, if those bad organisms that you've talked about are there and how do we control them in the presence of foods? Yeah, thank you very much, Sharon, for, for your question. And this moves me uh, neatly to the next uh, uh discussion on my on my presentation and uh, the, the food and drinks industry are guided by the government regulation the government lays down uh, criteria for different food groups and different organisms so the organisms that should be in the food in food at different levels and the organisms that should never never be mentioned uh, should never never be detected in food and as a microbiologist i would help the industry to analyze foods and help them to uh, maintain the standard which the government has laid down for them. So one of my role is then to do microbial analysis. And in the lab, what I would do if I get a food sample is I'm going to take a portion of the food sample. I'm going to mix it with a diluent to make a solution of it. And the solution will be serially dilute, diluted to this level of microorganism. And this will be plated on an agar plate, so a, a, a quarter media or an agar plate. So the, the agar plate you use depends on the organism you're trying to look for. And in my image on the right here, you can see the top uh, one with, uh, with black spot in a red uh, Petri dish. This is salmonella, which is, um, sorry, this is salmonella, which is 
showing on a plate and the presence of salmonella in any food is not allowed at all so for the other plates uh we have uh aerobic bacteria so these uh, organisms are called indicator organisms which uh, have a permittable level within different foods and uh, different raw materials and also different finished products so if the food industry uh, produce a product we would analyze it and we'll tell them the safety example for or for salmonella presence or the quality of the food product based on the aerobic uh, bacteria counts. And that is my role uh, as a, a food scientist. And um, I've talked so much about the presence of this organism and how we analyze them. But the next slide is actually going to talk about how to control them. So um, in controlling uh, foodborne pathogens, cooking at the right temperature and storing at the right temperature is very very important so trying to miss the danger zone i'm not sure if you can see the the, the image on the left uh, talks about a danger zone which is like temperatures where you should avoid placing any food at all so uh, if you cook at the right temperature microorganisms if they're present are killed and if you chill or freeze at the right temperature uh, you would minimize the growth of any organism that will cause any problem however if you stay within the danger zone this is very risky to the food product and obviously uh, very uh, unsafe for the public health so another way to control microorganism is to avoid cross-contamination after cooking so you can actually cook food at the right temperature but if you're not careful in handling the, uh, the food uh, then you can recontaminate the food which will make it then risky for people uh, uh, to eat so you could see the image in the middle that you've got cooked uh, meat product and then in the middle you've got raw raw food product this is not meant to be so you're not meant to uh, mix raw food uh, with uh, cooked food and um, obviously following good hygiene by washing hands before and after uh, uh, cooking and before and after eating is very important as well. So this uh, nicely moves me on to the uh, second part of my uh, presentation, which uh, I'm going to be using Ariana and um, Catherine's help to demonstrate the use of two instruments, as I said. So the first video is on gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Hi, I'm Marianne Nortali. I'm a research assistant at National Center for Food Manufacturing. And today I'm working with the gas chromatograph mass spectrum using the SPME technique. Good. So um, Ariana is using uh, GCMS, which is an analytical chemistry instrument. Uh, this is widely used for qualitative and quantitative analysis of food composition, food additives, flavor, aroma, and contaminants, such as uh, pesticides and natural toxins. So uh, in order for me to analyze a food sample, I have to prepare uh, the sample as a liquid or as a gas, which is uh, being collected within an enclosed space, as Ariana is just demonstrating. And for me to collect the gas, uh, I use a, a fiber, which is what Ariana has just injected into uh, the GCMS. So after the uh, sample injection, the sample is vaporized at very high temperature into the GCMS column and the display we get on the system monitor are, are peaks which actually represent uh, chemical composition of the food product and you can see the GCMS is very clever enough to actually give us the table of the of the compound and the name of the compound so the next um, um, before I go on to the next uh, demonstration I'm not sure if you've got any questions Sharon Yes, thank you, Dr. Bacola. Just um, from the point of view of uh, the uh, GCMS that you've just mentioned, how would we use that in the food industry? What would be some examples of what we'd do with it? Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, question. And I'll just move on immediately to the next slide, uh, which shows an uh, image of uh, oil. So for uh, one example of the application of GCMS in the food industry is to analyze oils. So you can analyze the fatty acid content of oils to determine uh, a good uh, oil and uh, not so healthy oil. And also in case oils are mixed cleverly uh, by fraudulent uh, 
fraudulent acts, all that look identical. If it's mixed, we cannot perceive this uh, by our naked eye, but the GCMS is clever enough to actually tell us the difference between uh, all that look perfectly identical. So you can see within my graph, this is an example of uh, a graph that will come up for a particular product that looks similar. And this is an example of graph that you get uh, with the second uh, sample. So you can see the difference in the chromatogram and also the difference in the percentage of the content of the uh, of the oil. So GCMS can help actually help to determine the healthiness of oil and also to determine adulteration in oils. Yeah, I hope that's the question. And just before you move on, Bacola, yeah. uh, we've just been asked how much one of these machines would cost. Okay, roughly, it's really hard to give an uh, estimate of cost, but I can give you a range. It depends on how much uh, technical the instrument is. The GCMS will cost roughly around 70000 and above. Yeah, don't quote me on this, but that's the rough idea that I have for that instrument. And for a texture analyzer as well, I think in the range of 30 plus, uh, 30,000 pounds plus, you get a, a good texture analyzer. Brilliant, yeah. thank you. And just before you move on to your uh, your next slide, uh, we've got another question about undesirable microorganisms in um home kitchens and what mm -hmm. handy tips we would be able to give so for me i think i'd certainly say hand washing uh, really really important and especially because of um the covid pandemic at the moment as well i think you mentioned as well bacola about temperatures earlier making yeah. sure things in the fridge are kept um as chilled as possible and i suppose one of the other things is making sure that people realize when they're in the supermarket doing their shopping the time it takes them to get the food from the supermarket back to their fridge because the longer things are outside of refrigerated temperatures uh, the quicker microbials can grow every every 20 minutes so is there any other handy, tip, handy tips dr bacola before we move on <laughs> you always said it all however i think um, good hygiene is also very important within the home so cleaning surfaces as well when you place foods uh clean the surface before you place any food and even after uh, placing raw food as well it has to be uh like antimicrobial uh, 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 cleansers can be used actually to clean and also separating uh, uh, chopping boards for meat uh, as compared to the ones for vegetables. So separating this clearly within the home would also uh, help in addition to what you said. Yeah, keeping pets out the kitchen while you're producing food is another um, handy tip. Okay. Yeah. And um, just gen a lot of it is really common sense, isn't it? But um, yeah. following the instructions on on um, packaging is really important as well. Okay. And yeah. and certainly having a, a understanding used by and best before dates, I think would be the other thing that we could add to that. So I hope that's answered that yeah. question. So yeah. I can see a, a cake in front of us now, Dr. Bacola. Yes. Yes, there is a cake in front, very um, interesting. So um, this is the texture analyzer and Catherine Winkle will be helping to uh, demonstrate this instrument and I'm going to play the video now. Hi, my name is Catherine Rincon and I'm a laboratory technician in the National Center for Food Manufacturing. I'm performing a texture profile analysis, which is a compression test for determining the textural properties of food. During a GPI test, samples are compressed twice using a texture analyzer to provide insight into how foods behave when chewed. The TPI test was often called the two bite test because the texture analyzer mimics the mouse biting action. Good. Yeah, so uh, this is a texture analyzer, as we said, and uh, texture analysis is the, the practice of testing the physical properties of food product, usually by compression, just as uh, Catherine mentioned. So physical testing of the, the food can tell us a lot about the tactile properties of food. And what I mean by tactile properties is the, uh, the, the properties that pertain to our sense of touch. So examples of these are the firmness uh, of, of food product, the fracturability of food product, and the resilience of, of, of food product as well. So um, why, why do we do physical testing of, of food? The two main reasons why we do physical testing of food for the food industry, and one of them is that 
Petal properties affect uh, consumer perception and acceptability of a food product. So once uh, a range of sensory acceptability is determined by running different um, texture analysis on different foods, a texture analysis test can be constructed to then distinguish between an acceptable product and an unacceptable product. So another reason we, we do physical testing of food uh, is um, the physical property of food affects the design of processing equipment. So quantifying uh, these physical properties is very helpful for the food industry to select and adjust equipment which are used for mixing, for example, which are used for transporting probably within a, a tube, within, uh, within the uh, uh, food manufacturing instrument, and also they are used for uh, packaging uh, of products as well. So uh, as a food scientist, I help the food industry to make, a se to make sense of sensory and um, also the properties um, of food that I will provide are actually measurable parameters which can be uh, documented for the food industry and they can use these parameters which are objectively measured to con co compare one food uh, from, from the other. And, uh, and that's my presentation. That's brilliant, yeah. and it just and it just reminds me watching those uh, videos, Dr. Bacola, how important the STEM subjects are to our uh, to food and drink industry. So we've been yeah. able to have a quick look at science, technologies, yeah. engineering in yeah. the in not just only in the machinery that produces food and drink, but also in the equipment that we use as food scientists, and of yeah. course maths. So maths of is hugely course, important yes. to you in data analysis. So that's really, really great. Yeah. So thank you ever so much, um, Dr. Bacola. So that's a really yeah. quick insight around uh, food safety and microbiology. So I'm going to introduce now Dr. Nicola, who's going to talk to us about food fraud and authenticity. Thank you very much, Professor Sharon. It's uh, lovely to be back again, hiding out in the back there and listening. Thank you, Dr. Bacola. That was really interesting. So as I say, my background is in microbiology and molecular biology, and I've done a lot of work looking at how we ensure that the food that we eat, let me just go through, and I'll start the next slide actually. So all the things that Bacola has talked about, thinking about food quality and food safety in terms of microbiology, that's obviously really important as we've been thinking about. So making sure that our food is safe to eat, and that it's got that lovely sensory qualities and all of those elements is really important. But there's another huge area of food safety we need to consider as well. And that's making sure that the food is what it is, what we says on the tin. So if we think about it, if we're buying a tin of condensed milk, we want to know that it is a tin of condensed milk and there's not something else in there. Or that powdered eggs are powdered eggs and it's not been mixed with other contaminants. And in the food industry, there are lots of regulations and laws that are responsible for making sure that that happens. And obviously the food industry has to comply with those laws. And the science industry has a huge role to play to help with that particular process. So what we're going to do in this session is talk a little bit about the techniques that we can use in the food industry to help us ensure that the food companies can comply with those laws to make sure our food is what it says on the tin. So there's a couple of obvious reasons why we'd need to know. Obviously, there's a food choice that the consumers want to know what they're eating is the right thing, but it can actually be more significant than that. So in terms of food choices, we may have a situation where somebody has made a decision to not eat certain types of food for ethical, moral or just personal choice reasons. So obvious examples there being veganism or vegetarianism. But also there'll be a group of people who have to absolutely avoid eating certain foods. And that's the case for people with food allergies. So on this next slide, this is the classic list of 14 allergies that must be listed by law on packaging within items sold in the food industry. Um, and it's really important that the food industry can guarantee that any of these allergies, if it's declared on the packaging, that they're not present, that they absolutely are not present within that particular item. Now, in terms of allergies, for many people, they may be allergic, but it becomes a particularly uncomfortable reaction. So maybe they get swelling or they get um, a, rea a rash that comes up or maybe their eyes get itchy. But for some people, of course, 
they can be, have a much more significant reaction. And I think one that's fairly familiar to us is the idea of peanut allergies. And certainly my children, for example, um, both of them can't take nut products. They couldn't take a peanut butter sandwich into school because we're well aware that there are people within the school that are severely allergic to peanuts and that could make them um, very ill. So the important thing here is that if food is labelled as allergen free, we need to make sure that that is absolutely the case. So really important there to read your labels on food and drink products, Dr. Nicola. And um, have you got any examples for us of where it has gone really horribly wrong um, for individuals? I can actually. There's a really good example that wasn't too long ago now. And this is where the legal uh, requirements around the food industry are quite interesting. So if we take a, a sandwich and we go to a supermarket and we buy a sandwich, then the packaging that's sold on that item has to list these al these allergenic compounds and make sure that people know that they're there. But there's an interesting element of the law that says a sandwich that's prepared on the premises actually doesn't have to be labelled in the same way. So there was a recent incident where a young lady bought a sandwich from an on-site preparation sandwich shop that didn't have these allergen uh, labelling on it and she wasn't aware that it contained a high concentration of sesame and that caused a major allergenic reaction, which actually sadly led to her death. And what's interesting now is in fact, there's been a lot of work in the background by her parents and they've changed that law so that now sandwiches that are prepared on site still have to have full allergenic labeling. So that's been a really big change, a really important change for people who have significant allergies in these areas. Brilliant, thank you. And we've just got a question popped in about uh, wondering why celery was always in bold on labelling. And is that because it's it's dangerous for some people? Absolutely. So here we go. This is celery is one of our 14 major allergens. And it seems odd, doesn't it? Because actually um, celery, it's a vegetable. It's, it's one of those things that's found in significant numbers. A lot of people use celery um, in food products as a flavouring but actually it can cause very significant allergies in some people. So while a lot of uh, food manufacturers just used to throw it in for that flavour enhancement, it's well, people are now well aware that there are significant problems with it. So yes, it absolutely must be labelled. There are some here which I was quite surprised to learn about. So um, lupin, for example, as an allergy, um, I don't think we've ever, I never really appreciated that lupin was used frequently in the food industry, but it is, and there are some people who have serious allergies. So these are the 14 that you can now look out for. So if you go and have a look at food labels, you can see whether these are labeled specifically on the packaging. So obviously for the food industry, what's really important is that they have a way of being able to check that their products so you'll find that there's a lot of food packaging that says free from um, or allergen free so how does the food industry work out whether that's genuinely true so they can put that on their packaging and they can be confident that that's the case and the simplest way they do it is what's with what's known as a lateral flow test so here's a bit of an, um, an image about how these work and what you have is an absorbent pad at one end that you drop your food sample on. So in a very similar way to taking that food stuff like Bacola talked about and you make it up into a solution and you can then drop this onto the absorbent pad and that will flow right the way through the lateral flow device. But what happens is there's a reaction between the allergen that we're interested in and these special antibodies that are present in our lateral flow device. And if we get the binding between the antigen and the antibody, as they pass through, they'll actually bind to these strips that are present on the lateral flow. And if you get binding, you get a colour change. So this is the way that we can identify whether those particular allergens that we don't want to see are present within our food sample. And the food industry does this all the time on a very regular basis, particularly on those allergen free lines. So part of the science behind this is for us in the laboratories to help come up with lateral flow tests that work effectively to help the food industry check their products and make sure that the allergens aren't being present in the food lines that they're working in. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Nicola, we've heard a lot about lateral flow testing <laughs> lately in the news. Is that the same process? It is exactly the same process. So lateral flow tests, we used to use... Um, 
not say lots, but they were available on um, supermarket shelves and in pharmacists. So this is exactly the process that is used for a pregnancy test. But now if we have anyone at school who's currently attending school on a regular basis, um, we have children, and certainly my two children are having these, one of them probably right now. Our standard COVID test, our lateral flow test works in exactly the same way. So how we're working there, we take our sample from our swab, from our nose or from our tonsils, and the antibodies we have here will actually bind to the proteins present on the surface of the virus. So again, as it passes through, if the virus is present, our test line strip will light up and we'll be able to see that there's a positive response. Good. So that's really good and works well if we know we want to check for that package. For example, we want to prove that there's no celery. So we can do a lateral flow test for the presence of celery. We don't get a line. We know that it's not there. But actually, we need to check a bit more widely than that sometimes. And one of the things we may need to look for is stuff that we don't know we're looking for. So a lateral flow obviously only works if we know we're looking for that particular protein. What if we don't know? What we're going to do now is have a look at a quick video about the use of a process known as SDS page. So this is, I'll tell you the fancy word because I like showing off knowing my big words. This is sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And so this is me. Um, I'm not sure you can, I know I like showing off Professor Sharon. It's always good sometimes. So this is me in the lab doing a video um, where I'm doing some work looking for all of the proteins that are present in milk samples. So here I'm taking from a big bulk of milk and transferring them into much smaller tubes. These are known as Eppendorf tubes. And the first thing we have to do with any analytical technique is separate out the components that we're interested in. So in milk, there's lots of different parts. There's fats, there's cellular material, but there's also lots of protein. So the first thing we do is a centrifugation and we spin those samples down. So we get rid of the fat, we get rid of the cell material, and then we can take a tiny, tiny amount of the liquid in the middle, which contains the proteins we're interested in. And then we can transfer that into a fresh tube. And that tiny little spot there, this is two microliters of liquid. So that's 0.002 millilitres. I hope I've got that right. So a tiny, tiny volume of liquid into our fresh tube. And then what we do is set up a very particular reaction to help us learn more about these proteins. So into this tube, I'm adding a whole pile of different chemicals. One of them you'll see, I think that's just going in. That's a color, that's a dye. Yeah, you see the blue there. So that will help us see these samples as we're preparing them. We're also going to be adding um, particular chemicals that denature our proteins. So proteins are quite complicated molecules. And for us to be able to analyze them properly, we need to denature them, make them a more simple structure. So we'll add particular types of chemicals to help break down the proteins. And then again, to denature them, what we end up doing is just heating them at 85 degrees for a little while. And as anybody knows who's cooked an egg, then that's what that's doing, that's denaturing our proteins. Then we have our page bit, and this is our polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So we have a gel that's a mesh of solution in a sort of semi-solid jelly. And what we can do is add our samples to the top of that gel. So this is me very, very carefully loading a sample of our protein. And that goes into a little well at the top of the gel and once all of our samples are loaded, we can then set the gel up to run an electric current through it. And as the electric current passes through, those proteins end up separating out. So they will separate out in this case, according to their size, because you imagine with our mesh-like gel, larger proteins can't travel as far, smaller proteins will travel much faster. And what we should see when the electric current comes on is that separation of proteins according to size. So we set it up quite a high voltage, that'll be 200 volts going through it. And then once it's going, we will cut to a picture of the gel itself. And there we can see, speeded up massively, this separation. So um, the lane on the left, the one that's splitting up into different colored bands, that's known as a marker ladder. 
and that helps us understand what sizes we're looking at. So you can see in real time how our proteins are separating according to size. So that's a really good way of doing it. And we can take our samples and all of those proteins, we can separate them out to learn a little bit more about what's in our sample, just like we can see in this picture here. So Dr. Nicola, how would we um, use that in products that we might buy from the supermarkets? One of the things that's, oh, oh hopefully, but yes, wonderful. So one of the things that, um, ends up seeing, actually, sorry, to ca cameraman, can we have that video back on please for a second? At the very end of it, thank you. So this is actually a really good example we have here. So um, I don't know if you mentioned, if you remember I mentioned at the start that we were looking at milk samples. And obviously now there's a huge range of different milks that are available to buy. Um, most people will drink cow's milk, but some people will choose goat's milk, for example, or sheep milk. And other people will choose um, vegetable milk or nut milk, so like soya or, or almond milk. And for some people, just like we were talking about with allergies at the start, uh, but some people will do that as a food choice. Some people will do that as a requirement. So, but unfortunately, milk can be quite expensive. So particularly goat's milk, as an example, is significantly more expensive than cow's milk. So unfortunately, there are people in the industry who will try and adulterate food, they will cause food fraud in order to make themselves some money. So by taking goat milk and mixing it half and half with cow's milk, you can sell it as goat milk and, and get much more profit from doing it. But of course, that could be really dangerous. And in fact, this gel here shows us exactly what we're working with. So if we go on the lanes from left to right, on the left, you'll see that's the marker ladder. So that tells us about the sizes of the proteins. The lane to the right of that, that's pure uh, pure cow's milk. And then the lane next to that is pure goat's milk. And I hope you can see that there's differences in those bands that are coming up. So about halfway down the gel, there's a huge, big, thick band in that cow's milk, but it's missing in the goat milk. And then what I did was created some adulterated samples. So those last two lanes are actually a half and half mixture of cow milk and goat milk. And I hope you can see in there that these, these additional bands that we shouldn't expect to see if, we, if it was pure goat milk. So we wouldn't know to have looked at this. This is where this the science comes back importantly in the industry. If we don't know that we're, if we're not expecting fraud, but we need to prove that it's there, then this is a really useful technique for us to do a bit of digging and work out a little bit more about what it is that we're looking for. And keeping safe people safe as you do it. Absolutely. We can go back to the slideshow, that would be great. Lovely, thank you very much. So SDS page looks at the first instance like a really good technique to use, but as you'll have realized from that gel, actually the only thing it can do is tell us how big proteins are. It doesn't tell us what they are. Um, now we can do more from that. So GCMS, which Dr. Bacola talked about earlier, we can use to learn more. So if I extracted that big thick band from the gel, we could run it through a GCMS and it would tell us what sort of protein it was. But most of the time, that's actually not terribly efficient way of doing it. Um, so we end up with SDS page of we know something's wrong, but we don't really know what it is. We don't know why it's wrong. We need more information. And one of the things that we can do to learn more information is to look at the DNA, because all of our food is made of cells, either from plants or from animals, sometimes, as you'll have realised from earlier, from microorganisms as well. And by looking at the DNA from those different cells, because DNA is specific to every organism that's present in the world, if we can look at that and learn more about it, it will actually tell us precisely what cells are present in our food. So what I want to do now is to show you a quick video of me extracting some DNA in the kitchen because I think it's quite easy for us to think, oh, this is really complicated science. But um, I, I, with, this is a technique that I set up and I've organised for actually extracting some DNA from my own cheek cells in my kitchen. So apologies for the poor quality decorating in the background. But what I'm doing here is setting up some salt water, just absolutely plain, simple salt water, quite a high concentration. And I'm going to use that as mouthwash. So I'm going to, you won't see me spitting, don't worry, swirling that around my mouth and really scraping my cheeks to get as many cells, both from my, my cheek cells and any bacteria, and get them out and into the liquid solution. Okay. 
So that's really important to have salt in there because it helps to stabilize the whole process, but it's nothing fancy, it's literally salt. The next thing I'm doing then is adding washing up liquid because our cells are covered in a fatty membrane on the outside. So by adding washing up liquid, that will break open those membranes and release all the contents of the cells into the liquid. The next step is maybe a little harder. We need some ice cold alcohol. Now, ice cold vodka does work. And obviously, because we may have some people on the call who shouldn't have easy access to ice cold vodka, you may need to ask for permission to do this. But by pouring the alcohol very, very carefully onto the surface of my salty liquid, we end up with two layers. So if you remember, we've got all the cheek cells in that bottom layer that I'm pointing to, and we have alcohol on the top. And I'm hoping you can just about see that there's some sort of fluffy clouds with little bubbles coming through. This is my, my young son shaky cam, so apologies that it's a little bit shaky, but can you see those little bubbly, cloudy bits, the stringy bits in there? And that's actually the DNA that's come out of solution. So this is a really, really effective technique to do. It works even better with um, particular types of food that has lots of DNA. So a really good example is strawberries or kiwi fruit. So lots of DNA inside them, lots of, lots of seeds. And you simply just crush up your strawberries in a bag and do exactly what we've done there. And you'll be able to extract your own DNA more or less anywhere. So hopefully demystifying a little bit. Obviously, when we do it in the lab, we, we are a bit more careful and we use some more complicated chemicals. But to get DNA out of cells, it's actually fairly straightforward. Okay. Thank you. And, and would you have any examples for us of where that might be used to uh, where that science can be helped in the food and drink industry? Absolutely. So, yes, this is what once we've thought about extracting DNA, we can then think more about um, learning more about it. So we can get our DNA out and we've got it nice and pure. And then what we do is carry out a technique that's known as polymerase chain reaction. And this was a technique that's actually only been, it's only about 40 years old. It's not a very new technique, uh, but it's also not an ancient technique. But we learned how to do this by understanding how cells work to replicate our DNA. So what we end up doing is splitting our DNA into single strands. And then this is the bit that allows us to be really specific. We have little bits of DNA known as primers. And those primers are unique to a particular type of organism's DNA. So they will bind if they find a matching sequence. And once these primers bind, you then end up with the enzymes being able to create another copy of the DNA. And then we go through the cycle all over again. So once that's happened, the DNA is broken open, the primers bind again, the amplification happens again, and it goes round and round in a circle, sometimes up to 30 or 40 times. So from a single piece of DNA, we can end up with millions of copies of DNA and only of the one that we're particularly looking for. So I've picked a couple of examples here of some PCR reactions which are particularly relevant to the food industry. So in this case, we're looking for DNA from, um, in the first instance, from cows and the second one here from buffalo. And by using these particular primers, you can see that we get different size fragments of DNA when we look at the beef. So we do when we look at the buffalo. So if we wanted to prove that our buffalo meat was pure buffalo, then we could run this PCR. And if we got this bound and nothing else, then we could be really confident that it was pure buffalo meat. And just another example here in exactly the same way, but we're looking at, um, this is beef, duck, pork, and mutton. And then we've mixed this DNA, also mixed these meat samples all together and run this PCR. And you can see by combining them, we actually get a little band for each. So we can say in this mixture of minced meat that actually our sample contains beef, duck, pork and mutton all mixed together. So an incredibly useful technique for us to really understand the content of our meat and, of course, any other type of food that we might want to do. Thank you. And was the, I, I think there might have been a story from a few years ago where this was really important in the food industry. Yes, there really was. So uh, this is probably where we really come back to, is it what it says on the tin? And this was the case where beef burgers were being sold in supermarkets. And when this exactly this process was carried out and people carried out PCR analysis to work out what DNA was present, 
they found quite a high concentration of pig meat and also some horse meat. So this is the horse meat scandal of, I think, 2013. 2013. 2013 horse meat yeah. scandal. And this is a perfect example of where science has had a huge impact in proving to the food industry that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, that there isn't any problems with fraud or unauthentic food, and that the consumers are getting genuinely what they should be getting and making sure that they can be held responsible for it. So obviously the science community has a really big responsibility to supporting food industry, to make sure that they can provide the product that they want to, but it's equally important for scientists to prove that they are doing it right. So we have both a supportive role and an investigative role in this. And we want to make sure that they're behaving according to the legal standards and that the food is, is exactly what we say. Brilliant. And we've just had a really great question come in about whether we can tell the difference between different oh. breeds of cow or cattle, but also thinking about something um, like, you know, really expensive um, beef, for example. Can we can, can it be scientific enough to actually be able to do that just in, in different breeds of cow? I was just going to say Wagyu beef. Yes. Yeah. Um, normally, the most that's that's really tricky. So it depends a little bit on the types of the breeds of cow and how so it's about the dna structure with this so if the dna sequences if there's a particular part of different breeds of cow that have a different dna sequence then yes absolutely mm -hmm. and i'll be honest i'll hold my hands up i don't know enough about the molecular biology of cows to be able to tell you that answer but if you can find a sequence of the dna that is different between say a frisian and a lincoln red then you yeah. can create primers to prove that yeah. Um, Wagyu beef, though, as far as I'm aware, is a processing technique and not necessarily a breed technique. And that is where some of the techniques that Bacola was talking about earlier can be really useful, because what you can start to look at then is the processing techniques and how long it's been aged, maybe, because that will have a different impact on the, the chemicals, the decomposition, the gases that are coming off. And so that GCMS technique can be used for that. Yeah. What I will say is one of the areas we also look at, though, is um, and the origin, country of origin from animals. And again, some of those techniques like, such as GCMS can be really useful to help us understand where that animal has come from. Um, and again, that's because of changes in the environment. So the food that they're eating, the soil that they're grazing on, the contents of the air and the water that they're drinking. So it's those vitamins and minerals, really, that are found within their body that can help us identify their location of origin. Yeah, and of course we've been using um, DNA profiling for many years in, in environments like um, animal production, finding the best animals that we can produce to, to create enough food that's um, viable. So typically if you take like a Jersey cow, for example, we know they produce really lovely creamy milk, but they wouldn't be very good at producing mass volumes of milk. And that's why you don't see huge amounts of Jersey cows perhaps out in the fields when you when you think about dairy cows that traditionally tend to be black and white. And as Dr. Nicholas says, they're the Frisian breed of cows that are, are well known for being able to produce lots of milk and um, being able to, to uh, be able to get that milk, th milk through the food production chain and at supermarkets so yeah thank you for those brilliant questions brilliant. so I'm almost finished but I did just want to leave you on one point because I've mentioned a bit about some of the, the fairly large scandals that have happened and of course the way the newspapers report it but there is a this one of the reasons that I like doing talks like this is to help people understand more about the science behind because let me just share with you something I do. So I'm actually doing some work with my students on the whole beach campus very soon. And we're going to be looking at, at oh, that way, uh, some of the contents within this pancake shaker. So this has got milk and eggs and uh, flour in there. So we've got some allergens in here as well. Um, so we're going to be looking at the content and making sure that it is what it says on the tin. But we have to be really careful about which scientific techniques we use and how we interpret the data, because just to leave it with you, if I did one of those DNA tests, the PCR tests on this vegetarian pancake mix, it says very clearly on the back, this product is vegetarian, I would find the presence of beef. And of course, we're not really looking at beef. What we're looking at is milk. But because milk contains cells from a cow, our DNA in there will be cow related DNA. And so it's really important in the science industry within the food industry 
but we make sure the work we're doing is explained really clearly so that consumers and the food industry as well can really understand what it is that we're doing to support them. And that's everything that I wanted to say. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, we haven't got long with you, but we hope you've enjoyed just a really brief insight uh, into uh, what we do at the University of Lincoln, but also how brilliant science is if you're ever thinking of a career in the sciences. And um, so all we need to say is enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. And thank you, everybody. <laughs>